look at that. Ah. Okay, so it is home base. Look at this. Look at the tones, man. I'm loving the, the colors. <laughs> it's really similar to Thor's uh, village, right? Oh. That's right. Maybe let maybe let him walk by. That's a lot of pretty girls. <laughs> He's got groupies. Why does he, he kind of sounds... Oh, look at this. Breaking it down. This is interesting, really. Great shot. Look at him watching his uncle. Right, and the money in the frame. <笑>あの、ドレオンだ。いや、ドレオンだ。うん。ノルウェーの土地の名だ。ああ。最近買ったんじゃ。漁師の血筋らしいが戦に負けて<笑><笑>役に立たないのは奴隷のせいじゃないぜ。あんたの使い方が下手なんだよ。はい。<笑> Strength and wealth. He legitimately looks surprised there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, jump back right in time. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. Had to let go, right? Oh, uh, you don't want to get grabbed by him. <laughs> Yo, I noticed the sword in the last episode as well. You know, the carvings on the sword and just the style of the sword as well. And then, of course, the armor. It's like a Roman, like a Roman type um, armor, right? Oh, stop that! <laughs> he knows the name. He's gonna get him to act out. That is not a man Askeladd's ever gonna... Like, he's never going to forget that man. Bjorn knows. He's trying to get him agitated. Mm. There could be... A bit of subtext in there, right? Mm. Is he trying to hint at there being more to the story, right? Floki being behind it? See, that's a part Thorfinn never knew. And here it is, he got him knocked out. <laughs> this score is undefeated. 
God damn, it's so good. Bro, he can break his arm if he wants to. Yeah, as, ex as expected, right? Oh. Oh. Did he break his arm? Maybe just a dislocation? Because breaking his arm is quite the price. Because he is part of his crew, right? <laughs> yeah, there's much to learn. Yeah. There's a lot of insight in that duel. A lot of great subtext. You know, that duel lived up to the hype in a lot of different... Not in the sense that it was just a hype duel, but a lot of great stuff came out of that. <laughs> yeah. Bjorn, man. Mm, right, yeah, they took that ship. <laughs> About that. Yeah, he's sure. Mm. Yeah, that is not a man Askeladd is ever going to forget. Ooh. About my pride in his own past. That could apply to many people. Maybe Askeladd himself. Slave to gold. Oh. Oh. <laughs> How about that? Oh, I've heard that before. How about that? Man, Escalade, come on. What a character, man, already. If it wasn't already clear that he's this really intriguing character, complicated character, this episode, man. Hmm, interesting. That he's thinking of this moment. Or, you know, he's having this uh, memory. Hmm. He'll get there. He'll get there. It'll take some time, a lot of experiences. You'll have to find out for yourself. Mm. Wow. Quite the scene, man. <laughs> Long story. Oh, my boy, but you do. Oh. You can actually feel the chilly aspect of this. There is, there is a place they've set up, but... Oh, wow. Oh, beautiful imagery, man. Right. His father's treatment of that slave. Ah. Just like his father told that slave. Give some hope. And it's good to see that, you know, this side is still in there. It might be suppressed. But Thorfinn still has that side in there. The compassion. It's, it's really giving me the chills and it's giving me goosebumps. Just that imagery, you know, the snow and the chilly aspect of it. Transportive. Whoa. New character. Look at that. Oh, Knut. 
Okay, I thought it was a female, but no, that's Canute. As in King Canute? Whoa. It's <laughs> a familiar name. Prince Canute. Okay, so he's gonna... Potential? No, 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 no. Oh, this is exciting, man, because I might not be a history buff. But I know King Canute. Canute has entered the game. King Canute? It's the guy for episode one, his war buddy. The laugh? It's him. Thor something. Ah, great episode, folks. Okay, folks, how about that? That is some episode. I mean, you know, surely that is, uh, for me at least, that is contender. It is certainly a contender for episode of the series so far. It might be the best. It really might be the best. Um, you know, from beginning right till the last moments, this was... Uh, uh, it really was a phenomenal episode. Uh, I, um, I just absolutely appreciate everything about that episode. Um, and, you know, the fact that it felt like there was so much going on in this episode kind of felt like a 45-minute television episode, but condensed into, like, the 24 minutes right, 22, 23 minutes of an anime episode. And, you know, that in itself shows you just how fantastically directed this episode is, or this uh, anime is in general. But this episode specifically, just some fantastic directing throughout. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm blown away. You know, the, the feeling I was getting by the end of this episode was, okay, yeah, this, this anime is going to end up becoming one of my favorites, right? Um, and it's already so high up. Um... Eight episodes in, I feel like this is, you know, providing and uh, promising uh, so much more than some of the other anime I've seen. Um, and I, again, I've only seen a handful of uh, anime, right? Uh, so, you know, the, the pool isn't that large just yet in, in terms of, you know, comparing. Um, you know, you know, I've mentioned One Piece here and there. I'm not going to bring that in. That's not, that's something else entirely. That That is like a part of my life. You know, I've been watching One Piece for more than half my life, so I don't even bring that into discussions about, you know, best anime I've watched. That's something else entirely, right? So I just leave that out of these types of discussions and rankings. Uh, so in, ultimately, I'd say there's four, right? Shingeki, Death Note, uh, Vinland Saga, and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Those are the four. Um, and yeah, you know, this certainly has all the makings of something that could be right up there. You know, I'd say at this point in time, uh, Shingeki is certainly top. You know, uh, I've mentioned that it is one of my uh, favorite stories of all time m on multiple occasions. Um, so yeah, you know, that's up there. But, but of course, that's really deep into its story at this point, years into its story at this point. So, you know, of course, you can't really compare uh, an anime that's only eight episodes in to that. But I must say, this has all the makings of something that could rival that. Uh, certainly could rival that by the time it's like 60 uh, maybe like even two seasons deep, maybe three seasons deep, even earlier than that, actually, given the subject matter of this anime, uh, the really grounded uh, subject matter of this anime. Um, and you know uh, how I mentioned that this 24 minute uh, anime episode felt like a, you know, a 45 minute television episode, perhaps a live action episode. Uh, even beyond that, it kind of ha it has such a cinematic quality about it, right? Again, it's just the perfect mix of all these things, right? Uh, the score and the subject matter, uh, the directing, uh, the imagery, the evocative imagery. Oh my goodness. This feels like such a complete cinematic experience to me. Um, and it puts me in that mindset, really puts me in that zone. Uh, you know, throughout this episode, I felt that uh, multiple times. Um, uh, that transportive uh, uh, feeling almost. But of course, you know, fantastic episode. And how do you kind of top that? You introduce two new characters. I mean, one new character, but uh, a reintroduction of someone I've seen already. Uh, just a quick glimpse though, right? In episode one, um, you know, Thor's uh, war buddy, essentially. Um, Thor something. His name also begins with Thor, but it was something else. Uh, I'll look it up and I'll, I'll have the name for uh, next time as well. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, reintroduction for him, uh, that certainly immediately sets up this, you know, potential confrontation that could happen. Uh, perhaps Askeladd's crew, uh, you know, Thorfinn is part of Askeladd's crew. And then, you know, there's a history here, of course. He knew Thorfinn's father. So I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I expect that angle to come into it at some point. But, you know, it all depends. Uh, I just saw a glimpse of him and he's on the opposite side. He's helping the English at this moment in time, right? Um... Uh, well, I mean, he's been paid clearly, right, to help them. So he's on that side, right? So let's see how this plays out. Uh, like I mentioned, immediate setup for confrontation. Um, so yeah, you know, there's that angle as well now, that there's a connection, Thorfinn and this guy, Thor something. <laughs> a lot of Thors. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, but, you know, I doubt there's going to be any, you know, bonding anytime soon. But, you know, the potential is there. And I'm pretty sure I've recognized yet another One Piece voice actor, Blackbeard. The voice actor for Blackbeard. That was, I mean, that laugh is so unique. Everyone knows that laugh. Uh, <laughs> even if you tried to change it a bit for this character, it, you know, it wasn't going to happen. You could, you could just, it's in there. It's so unique. So yeah, you know, it's great to recognize a lot of One Piece voice actors um, here and another anime as well. You know, Death Note has a few of them as well. And of course, the other character, the actual new character introduction is quite the staggering one because it appears to be Canute, King Canute, but introduced here in his days as Prince Canute. So this is really exciting, isn't it? The early days before he was King Canute. Now, like I mentioned, I'm not really a history buff and I'm never going to pretend to know more than I do, right? But I know King Canute. I, I've heard of King Canute. Um, uh, that this is so exciting. This is so exciting. And you know, I, I know that this is historically accurate for the most part, uh, this, this enemy. So if they're actually following his trajectory all the way up to uh, King Canute, and I'm, I'm guessing they are, surely, you know, it's too juicy not to explore. I'm about to see a staggering arc, right? Because King Canute's achievements are staggering, right? Um, yeah, this is really exciting. If it wasn't already exciting enough, now you introduce... Canute, and you reintroduce um, this guy, his partner, his war buddy, um, who's a man mountain, absolute beast of a man, right? You know, I call Thor's a man mountain. This guy might be even more brutish and, you know, hulkish. You see his axe throw is just absolutely devastating. So if they do come up against him, uh, and if they do, it might be soon, right? Because there's another uh, time skip, uh, a year, uh, because it's summer now, right? So yeah, you know, if this kind of plays out like um, the last episode, you know, Thorfinn going in and trying to get the commander's head. Oh boy, oh boy, he's got to be careful. So you can see the long-term uh, tracks are already being laid here, you know, in episode uh, episode 8. Um, through uh, the introduction of Prince Canute, right? Who ends up being King Canute. And again, I don't really need to go into all his achievements or anything. I think all of us know, right? Uh, or most of us know about King Canute and the things he does achieve. Again, staggering. So if that's going to be followed closely in this anime, I'm in for a tremendous time. A tremendous time. Uh, no doubt about it, man. And you know, I keep saying this is uh, perhaps the best episode of Villain. Uh, you know, beyond that, that certainly makes it one of the best anime episodes I've seen uh, altogether, right? In like my all-time list, essentially. Again, it's not the biggest selection just yet. Four, right? Now, again, there's one piece, but I kind of keep that separate. You know, going off on a tangent, one piece is one of those things that I don't care. You know, I don't need to convince anyone to watch it. I don't, I honestly don't really even care about anyone's opinion on it. You know what I mean? Uh, not, not in like the arrogant sense, but in the sense that I know what it means to me. You know, I know what it means to me and I, I don't need anyone's opinion on it. I don't really care about if people dislike it or, you know, whatnot. Of course, you know, from time to time, I like to share my love for it with fellow One Piece fans. But, you know, I'm trying to say that I don't care if someone, you know, rips on it or, uh, thinks it's, you know, childish or it's uh, too long, any of that, I don't care. All I know is what it means to me. It's been a part of my life uh, for a long time, more, again, more than half my life. So I don't like to bring it into comparisons. You know, also, how do you compare One Piece to something like Shingeki or Vinlin? It's such a totally different type of tone and subject matter, right? So it's hard to compare them, even if I wanted to. And I'm not, you know, I'm not comparing One Piece to anything. That's a choice I've made a long, long time ago. You know how I mentioned that uh, immersive cinematic quality about this. Um, you know, one of the standout scenes, again, of not just this episode, but the entire anime and anime in general is 
of Thorfinn and the slave girl, uh, Hordaland, or Horda, let's call her Horda, uh, on, 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 the, on the boat, right, on the longship. Wow. A phenomenal scene, man. That is, um, you know, even during the scene I mentioned, it's got this transportive quality. Just that imagery of the dark sea at night and, you know, the snow just raging, or the flurries just raging right in front of the camera, uh, in front of the shot. Oh my goodness, those moments are just... Uh, um, see, that's the type of thing I'm always going to remember. I'm, from this point on, I'm always going to have this, you know, uh, memory of that scene specifically. Uh, there's, you know, some sometimes in shows, in anime, stories, right? Uh, visual storytelling, uh, though you can also make a case for, you know, books. Because, of course, our imaginations are incredible, right? So, yeah, you could also, you know, make a case for making great memories or scenes in your mind, you know, through reading books. Uh, so yeah, it applies there too. But, you know, in, in this, uh, you know, specific case, yeah, you know, from time to time, there's all these scenes in a movie, in a show, in an anime that just stick with you. You know, they just have this haunting quality about them that they just kind of stick with you. This had that, you know, as I was watching it, this already had that feeling. And another reason I think this could end up becoming one of my favorite stories is because of some of the fantastic characters. And again, at this point in time, the standout character who could end up becoming one of my favorite anime characters or even characters in general, right? I, I don't have to specify anime, but yeah, it, just in any story, Askeladd, oh my goodness. I mean, I mean, if it wasn't already clear enough, this episode certainly drives that point home that this character, Askeladd, this individual is um, quite a layered, and sophisticated individual, right? Uh, who has quite a complicated sense of morality as well about him. Um, he's quite the pragmatist. He's quite the realist, uh, especially given the situation he finds himself in, right? The position he finds himself in, the people he's surrounded by, uh, and the things he's okay with, right? Uh, and he takes part in, yet there's a lot of different layers to him. And I think this episode was probably the most comprehensive take on Askeladd, uh, or, you know, deep dive into Askeladd's character. And, you know, I mean, it's just scratching the surface, I think. There's so much more I need to know about Askeladd, um, especially his past. I think his past is now being set up as something quite important to him, something that kind of is still a part of him. So of course, you know, a backstory, potential backstory, learning more about his past um, is always, you know, uh, right on the top of my list at this point. Uh, as you know, if you know my content, you know I love backstories. I love getting to learn about characters, right? Again, a backstory can completely paint the character in a new light or, you know, fill in some really important bits um, to really elevate that character even further and help you understand their disposition. So yeah. Uh, more backstory for our Askeladd at some point in this in, in the anime, sh you know, it should be quite exciting, I think. Um, again, you know, uh, there's a lot of things, you know, there's stuff like his armor, his sword. Again, you know, he stands out quite a bit because his armor is kind of like a Roman uh, style armor and even his sword as well, right? And, you know, he's, men he's mentioned his uh, ancestor Arturios, um, right? And he only mentioned Arturios. Um, Arturios, I, I may be mispronouncing that, but I believe it was Arturios. He only mentioned that, um, uh, I think, as he was speaking to Thor's, right? Making that promise, right? Uh, his ancestor Arturios. But then he's also uh, then, you know, made promises through Ulf, I believe, right? Um, so yeah, you know, the distinction there is quite a specific one. And of course, you know, there's no chance, no chance in hell that he forgot Thor's. Uh, I mean, I think anyone could see that. I mean, meeting someone like Thor's was quite the experience for him as well, right? Something he still carries as well, right? I, you know, if you go back to that episode, I remember him telling that one guy, the young guy, you know, uh, a warrior like Thor's is worth a hundred bratty children like you or a hundred brats like you, right? Something along those lines. I mean, it was certainly quite the experience for um, Askeladd as well. And you see that ultimately he he regret he regretted that he had to go through with this. But again, you know he was on a job and he had to uh, complete the job. But you see he had respect for Thor's. Um, um, I mean, ultimately he even offered him right. He's like, you should come join us. You know, lead the men. Right? Uh, there's that moment. Uh, his you know his crew was kind of confused. They're like, you're joking, right? Yeah. So it was certainly quite the experience. So you know, of course he didn't forget Thor's. Uh, it was quite clear. I think anyone could see, uh, except <laughs> Thorfinn himself. I mean, Bjorn certainly saw it. You know, he put 
He's like, ah, he bought it. Thorfinn played right into his hands. I mean, he got him to react in a manner that played right into his hands. Um, and, you know, essentially manipulates him into being enraged, right? Um, and yeah, that was, you know, that was that. Done and dusted. And of course, as expected, you know, he... No one, I don't think anyone was actually expecting Thorfinn to, you know, win this duel. It was just too early, right? He's got so much learning to do. Yes, his set of skills is impressive. And I, be I believe I mentioned this in the discussion for the last episode. Yeah, he's got an impressive impressive skill set. Uh, even, you know, people like Bjorn are quite impressed. Uh, Askeladd was also, you know, taken back at one point. Um, and he was also, you know, no he was noticing his skills. And, you know, also going back to him being taken back, you know, there's a moment and he's legitimately surprised to see how much Thorfinn's grown, you know, really getting a proper look at him standing right in front of him, right? You could, he, he probably had that flash of young Thorfinn, right? And he mentions, oh, you were like this high back then. So there, in that sense, there's this, you know, aspect of the past kind of catching up with um, Askeladd as well, right? That was legitimate, like legitimate surprise in his face to see how, how much this uh, child has grown. Um, but, you know, Beyond just that, uh, like I mentioned, it, was, it wasn't just like a hype duel. It certainly had that aspect, right? Again, fantastic music selection and, um, you know, the duel itself, the fight itself was just um, uh, wonderfully executed, I think, um, beautifully executed. But beyond just the duel itself, right, there's a lot of just fantastic subtext built in. And that's another thing this anime just excels at, right? The subtext. Um, not everything has to be spoken. You know, there's a lot of really distinct facial expression going on, right? Uh, through characters like Bjorn, through characters like Askeladd, um, even Thorfinn himself, and many of the other characters. Uh, a lot of subtle facial changes or changes in the facial expressions. Uh, there's a lot to read into it, right? Askeladd uh, had quite a bit of that in this episode, right? So not everything has to be spoken dialogue. Um, and, you know, I think it's tough to pull off in something that's animated, but they're doing it to great effect. But, you know, like I mentioned, Askeladd, he knows him, you know, he's watched him grow up. He's been, you know, watching over him just like Bjorn's been watching over him. And, you know, I love that. I love that. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it's almost like a, a, a proud uncle type thing. Not a proud uncle, but like an uncle type figure, right? That he's also watching over um, Thorfinn and he's kind of rooting for him. You know, he is, you know, backing his growth, essentially. You see, you see, once he does kind of, you know, fall into Askeladd's trap, he's, uh, you know, kind of like, ah, he's kind of disappointing. Uh, I mean, even the fact that he has a reaction to that uh, is quite telling, right? Yeah, he's quite invested in Thorfinn uh, from the looks of it. So yeah, you know, that's another um, angle I really want to see explored a bit further, that relationship, that potential relationship there. Right? Because, you know, like I mentioned a long time ago now, it feels like a long time ago before the break even, you know, characters like Bjorn are also going to play a part in his growth, right? And his character development, his development as uh, a person trying to survive out here in this landscape. Uh, so yeah, that's another angle I would love to, you know, get more on. And then, you know, uh, before I move on from Bjorn, there's that moment right at the beginning of the episode as those the twins, I can't, I guess I can't remember their names. Uh, yeah, for some reason, I, I can't seem to remember their names, but, you know, they said, oh, you survived. You're still alive. Is that, is, does that mean anything? Is there a significance to that? You know, he kind of gives them a side eye. Uh, I believe he said, you're still alive. Uh, so, yeah, let's put a pin in that, if, you know, that means anything. Uh, I mean, how, it, you know, it kind of sounded like they're expecting him to die at some point. But, you know, circling back to the duel itself uh, and a lot of the really great subtext going on uh, and a lot of different moments playing out there, there's this moment that, you know, he's speaking of how that was such a long time ago. Uh, to me, it also felt like he's asking Thorfinn, do you really understand or remember, you know, what actually happened there, right? Beyond just, you know, uh, on a basic level that I killed your father, right? Because that he certainly did. But, you know, again, there's more to it than that. And of course, Thorfinn doesn't know any of that, right? And he actually, uh, it, it sounded like he might have done that for the first time. He said, oh, yeah, I remember now. It was the fool who gave up his life to save his child, right? His son. Uh, so it appears that he might have said that for the first time to Thorfinn, right? It's possible. Again, they've spent a lot of time together, so, you know, some things might have been skipped over, like, I think it's clear that this was not the first duel, even though it made it kind of sound like the first duel in the last episode. They've been at it for years at this point. And also a bit of a hint at, oh, do you really know the true story or the full story behind this, right? And as I mentioned, maybe, you know, he's alluding to... Uh, you know, Floki's involvement in this uh, and maybe, you know, in the near future he might tell him about Floki um, but ultimately, yeah, you know 
Thorfinn sees Askeladd as the man who pulled the trigger, uh, essentially. <laughs> I mean, and again, I think Askeladd's also trying to, you know, help him maybe understand his motives, right? Or question his motives, you know? Really ask yourself, uh, you know, what's the reasoning behind this? Why do you keep at it, right? Do you really understand? Um, and, you know, again, that goes into something else uh, later in the episode. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this is something I've already heard in an anime before. So, uh, you know, everyone's a slave to something. Every living human is a slave to something. You know, it's not specific just to anime, but, you know, I've heard it twice now in anime. Kenny Ackerman from uh, Shingeki, one of my favorite, you know, uh, limited uh, appearance characters. He was quite the impactful character. And now you have Askeladd here uh, echoing the same sentiment. I mean, yeah, oh my goodness. He's not wrong either, is he? Uh, and it certainly applies to himself, because he's certainly someone who knows himself inside and out, so he's certainly uh, a slave to something as well. Uh, perhaps for someone like Askeladd, it could be, um, you know, the thirst for glory, ambition. But, you know, you also brought up the concept of being bound by your pride and past, right? So a bit of that as well, maybe for uh, Askeladd. Again, I don't know much about him, and I mentioned, I, you know, I would love to learn more about his past, uh, because there's certainly something quite intriguing there. Right, so I was getting a lot of that. And you know, I did get that feeling of that one scene, you know, him seeing uh, Thorfinn in front of him, kind of like a representation of his past catching up with him. And of course, there's a great transitional hinge there, right? As he's saying that to the, to the guy, tells him that every living human being is a slave to something, transitions to Thorfinn on the longboat, right? Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, Thorfinn doesn't really realize it, but he's certainly subservient to this notion of vengeance, isn't he? And I thought the really telling part of this interaction between um, Horda, uh, Hordalan, and uh, Thorfinn was, you know, her saying, oh, you seem, you know, you seem like, just like me. She recognized that behavior, right? She just felt like they're similar in that sense. And, you know, yeah, she felt that, yeah, he he's exhibiting some of the, you know, same behavior, but you see Thorfinn uh, immediately snaps at her because he does not like this. He does not like being compared in that sense, right? He He's clearly against the idea of being called a slave, right? Or having that mentality of a slave. Though, you know, it's being having the mentality of a slave is beyond just being uh, an actual slave in, in the sense of ownership, right? Uh, again, that's why, you know, this whole uh, being a slave to something is such a powerful uh, notion, uh, such a powerful concept, right? But he he doesn't quite grasp that, yeah, he is a slave to something as well, right? Um, there is something driving him, something that is uh, bound to him, right? Or he's bound to. Um, and he berates her. He tells her, no, I'm nothing like you. I mean, he's quite insensitive towards her, though he reels it back in uh, a bit later, right? Uh, and then you see that he still has some of that compassionate side that does resemble his father's compassion, right? Um, but yeah, you know, he berates her and he tells her, oh, if I was you, I would just kill Gorm and run, right? Yet he couldn't do the same thing. He couldn't do that, right? So the fact that he snapped at her and he said that, um, yet he couldn't do the same thing to Askeladd as he was in his bed. Yeah, that moment, you know, that moment he uh, remembers his father and the treatment his father offered to the runaway slave, the compassion on display, you know, that, that came out of him, right? Uh, that inspired him. Uh, seeing uh, Horda in front of him like this, you know, just thinking of how um, dark and cruel this world is, right? He offered a bit of light, right? A bit of beauty, right? A bit of hope by mentioning Vinland. And of course, even though it was in a dream sequence, uh, it was great to see Thor's back in it. And I thought it was really interesting that at that point in time, after, you know, his defeat to Askeladd and, you know, feeling kind of down. And of course, you know, his uh, arm was kind of wrapped up. You see that, you know, his mind is kind of drifting there. Uh, towards his father, thoughts of his father, memories of his father. And once again, you know, <laughs> the ghost uh, in the dream, but, you know, the ghost of his father. Uh, again, it's a common, you know, it's a common uh, trope, essentially, you know, being visited by the, the ghost of the father, be it in a dream, be it in a vision. He reiterates his message, his lessons, right? No one is your enemy. You know, a true warrior does not need a sword. Uh, but, you know, you see that it's been established that it's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of different learning experiences, a lot of different years, sorry, a lot of years before he gets to that stage that he understands that lesson. Going all the way back to some of the earlier episodes, it was clear even then, you know, he's going to get to that stage, but it's going to take time. It's going to take years. He's going to have to come to that on his own, as his father kind of mentioned in that dream sequence, right? Uh, he'll get there, but it's a long road ahead.
you know, I feel like once he starts getting his emotions in check, right, uh, starts controlling his emotions, um, and perhaps, you know, perhaps he has to do a bit of emotional developing for that to even begin because, you know, he's not there just yet. Um, he hasn't had a chance to emotionally develop, essentially. But, you know, I think that's going to play a key role in him finally starting to grasp his father's lesson. And you see, you know, his emotional outburst uh, or being so emotional was one of the reasons he kind of fell right into Askeladd's trap, right? Because, again, Askeladd knows him inside and out. He's been watching him. Like I said, you know, he's been watching over him. Even though Askeladd might not make it look like he cares, I think he does care a bit, right? But again, you know, it's it's like a... It's like a, you know, win-win for Askeladd, right? Of course, he's using uh, Thorfinn as well for his own uh, gain, but there's another angle to it, and I've covered that extensively in some of my past discussions for this anime, right? You know, and of course, you know, going back to that whole concept of everyone being a slave to something, even Thor's was a slave to something, right? He was subservient to his pacifist stance, right? And following that stance and not deviating from that stance. And you know, Thorfinn kind of mentioning Vinland as this compassionate side came out as he remembered uh, the incredible compassion his father showed to that runaway slave. I think some of his subconscious desire is also kind of leaking out at that point, right? It's still in there. It's still deep in there. You know, this idea, this notion of Vinland and the things it has to offer. But again, you know, this episode is full of just some fantastic uh, moments for Askeladd, right? Uh, or some fantastic Askeladd moments, you know, one of them being you can make use of anyone with the right approach, as he's been doing all these years with Thorfinn, right? So again, that gives you a bit of an insight uh, into his um, handling of Thorfinn and, you know, why he keeps him around. And of course, you know, one of those things out of many has been, uh, you know, him effectively channeling Thorfinn's rage and aggression, right? Um, but yeah, you know, uh, again, he, t he tells his uh, uncle Gorm that, you know, you're completely misusing or you you're not utilizing this slave of yours correctly, right? Given her background, given her, um, you know, uh, privileged upbringing, she must have qualities that a lot of others, she must have really rare qualities in that sense, right? And he's not utilizing her to her capabilities. But, you know, uh, lastly, let me circle back to the opening of the episode. The concept of, uh, you know, good or evil being a matter of perspective is certainly a display here, right? You see that this village is kind of similar uh, to Thor's village in the beginning of the series, right? It's so similar in that sense. Uh, there's good people here, there's family here, there's children here. They they give uh, Askeladd and his men a warm welcome, a hero's welcome uh, for Askeladd. He's got groupies, you know, it, there. It's kind of disconnected, right? Yes, you know, they might be out there, you know, there's a lot of malicious behavior. They're not good people. Askeladd and his men are not good people. You know, they're out here raping and pillaging. You know, their world, right, uh, it being this village here, is prioritized over everything else, right? Here, they're the good guys, right? And again, a matter of perspective in that sense. Right then, that's about it for this one. I'm really quite excited about this anime, this story, uh, and it really does have the makings of something that could end up being one of my favorites. So once again, thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you again soon for the next one. Until then, take it easy.